On Sunday, the United States sent armored vehicles to Haiti under the guise of defending the country against gangs who threatened to oust Prime Minister Ariel Henry. Last month, Henry announced an end to fuel subsidies, causing shortages and soaring prices. This prompted an explosion of anti-government protests across the country. Adding to the already existing unrest caused by Henri's, quote, illegitimate tenure as prime minister, Henri was never elected or formally confirmed by the legislature and has continued to postpone new elections. Joining us now to discuss is English language editor at AD Liberté, Kim Ives. Welcome, Kim Ives. Thank you, Robbie. Great to see you again. So give us an update on, you know, what the situation is like in Haiti right now. Well, it's very critical, very bad, and this really is the result of <laughs> three decades of U.S. meddling in Haiti. And they're trying to do it again through the Security Council. They're trying to send another force, that will be the fourth in a century, into Haiti to um, intervene, invade militarily, and the Haitians don't want it. They're in the streets in Haiti. They're in the streets here in New York. <laughs> Uh, saying no to foreign military intervention. But um, the UN has a problem, or I should say the US has a problem because the UN, uh, now that we're in a multipolar world since February, 2022, uh, it's not so easy to get the rubber stamp of a UN force. So they're trying all these maneuvers to make it a bilateral arrangement that the UN will sort of bless and uh, this falls right in line with the new Global Fragility Act that the U.S. Uh, passed in 2019 with total bipartisan support, uh, which essentially establishes a bilateral relationship and they wed USAID, the humanitarian arm of the State Department, with the Pentagon. So here we have soldiers coming in with sacks of rice, gift from the American people, but essentially it's to put down uh, people who are threatening U.S. power in Haiti. Has there been any, uh, sorry to cut you off, has there been any progress on, Ariel Henry is, is believed, right, to have been involved with the assassination of, of the former leader of Haiti, uh, Jovenel Moïse. Has there been any updates in that investigation? Is it more conclusive now, one way or the other? No, uh, no updates, and it's pretty patent that he was involved. He made two calls to uh, the guy who ordered the triggerman to shoot uh, Jovenel Moise, uh, from what we know, and uh, he claims he doesn't remember the calls, but, you know, the phone records are right there. Uh, and uh, the U.S. involved, I mean, the FBI spent two to three months down there investigating, going through everything. We haven't heard a peep from them. Uh, one of the uh, the believed trigger man, a guy called uh, Antonio Palacios Palacios, Colombian mercenary, uh, is on trial in Miami, and the U.S. has sealed his uh, <laughs> evidence or what he has to say from his uh, defense. Uh, this is, uh, as one U.S. official said, telegraphing CIA involvement. So it's looking more and more like the U.S. had a hand in this. So can you give us some background about what investment the United States has in ousting Mo Moise and maintaining the current president with this now military aid that they're trying to get into the country? What's, what's the goal well, here? Mm -hmm. Well, Moise was starting to have second thoughts, it's appeared. He was basically browbeaten by uh, Donald Trump to uh, fall in behind the U.S. campaign against Venezuela, endorse Juan Guaido, say Maduro was illegitimate. And uh, he did that. He was the hood ornament on the uh, U.S. tank against uh, Venezuela for, for a while. But he started to see that the U.S. wasn't really giving him the backup that he needed, and he was entertaining uh, reopening relations with Maduro. And at the same time, a month before his assassination, he received the Russian ambassador and apparently took a trip to Turkey just a couple of weeks before he was killed uh, and uh, was, according to sources who are pretty reliable, uh, was trying to find a line to Putin. So uh, it looks like the U.S. started to say this guy's uh, become a liability and uh, they, they had to ditch him. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating that, I mean, I remember covering that story when it happened and that there seemed to be very little appetite in the way of follow-up or accountability here. We've been talking a lot mm -hmm. 
um, on this show and elsewhere about kind of the lack of left response to the um, kind of push for regime change in Russia and how a lot of people who are positioning themselves as anti-war in this moment are on the right. And it is curious to see the relative amount of silence uh, about what's going on in, in Haiti. Can you tell us a little bit about the tenor of the objections and the protests that have been happening both here and in Haiti? I see them being framed uh, in many places as a kind of um, gang activity as opposed to political protest. What's the truth there? Well, yesterday, uh, the U.S. ambassador in the U.N. put all the blame on uh, a so-called gang, an armed neighborhood federation is what we call it, uh, the G9. They're saying, oh, they're the ones choking. Uh, I have uh, Greenfield's exact quote here. Uh, Jimmy Cherizier, known as Barbecue, he is directly responsible for the fuel shortage that is crippling the country. Well, that's just plain false. Yes, they put up a barricade like all Port-au-Prince has put up barricades. It's totally specious to say that the G9's barricade is uh, blocking the whole country. No, it, all of Port-au-Prince, in fact, most of Haiti has barricades all over the place. So the fuel truck might get a block out of the gate, but uh, it's going to hit another barricade. So the people are standing up because who is choking Haiti? The International Monetary oh, Fund. So. They're the ones dictating that the uh, fuel prices be raised and the Haitian people are saying no. Hmm. Well, Kim Ives, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. We'll have more rising right after this. <laughs>